Okay. Uh, this particular um, trajectory that I just chose, it has a, a bunch of spatial dimensions. Okay. Now, if you want, um, it's uh, basically a ratio of two to two, two units high, three units wide. So it's it's half again as wide as it is tall. Okay. And the interesting thing about any trajectory like this one, the first half of a baseball's flight to the outfield is, if you know the spatial dimensions, they could tell you everything you need to know uh, if you analyze carefully. Right? You can derive the equations of motion for the baseball from knowledge of these measurements, the uh, width and the height. Uh, of the first half, or the width and the height of the entire trajectory. Now we're working with the first half. The second half is symmetric. It's just you know curving downward, you know on the on the down, uh, you know on the way down. Same uh, speeds, but the the velocities are all downward because it's falling down, uh, and it's moving to the right. Now the other thing I want to mention to you is, in addition to spatial dimensions. Uh, the alternative um, strategy is if you know the initial velocity, like these two arrows here, uh, the initial y component of the velocity and the initial x component of the velocity down here, the sideways black arrow. Uh, those, you know, and the initial velocity itself, the composition of those two arrows is like tilted at 53 degrees. Um, if you know those, and there are the symbols for each, VIX for the horizontal arrow, VIY for the vertical arrow, VIY meaning the initial Y component of the velocity, VIX meaning the initial X component of the velocity, um, those can tell us everything. You know, so there's a couple different ways to attack this problem. You know, our objective is to figure out the equations of motion. Or, as I've mentioned before, the time evolution equations for the position and velocity of the, of the uh, baseball. And in the day of Galileo, his, this was high tech in his day. And, he, you know, they, they didn't have baseball in his day. Um, but they were concerned about the flight of a cannonball. And as I mentioned before, that was the military technology of his, his day. And that's why he tried to figure all this stuff out. You know, so we want to uh, figure this out, get the, the time evolution. Uh, and in, in our day at Mission Control in Houston, we, they would be trying to figure out uh, the time evolution uh, of the orbit or trajectory of a spacecraft. Now... Let's start with the spatial dimensions. We're going to start from that basis. You know, we could either start with the spatial dimensions or we could start with initial velocities. We're going to start with spatial dimensions because they're particularly easy. And I didn't choose it this way, but it works out that in this graph paper from lecture two, it was 20 blocks tall and 30 blocks wide. All right, that's not too bad. We'll work with that. And so you, you have to then ask yourself, all right, if this is a baseball, uh, you know, what, are, what should I make the units of measurement for a baseball? So I thought to myself, well, a meter, per, one block per meter would not be too bad. You know, so if I say that the baseball's flight is 30 meters across from the left to the right uh, and 20 meters high, that would be fairly good. You know, a total of 60 meters travel for a, for a baseball, you know, from... So right down here, this is home plate, or as we might say in our coordinate system, 0, 0, in the metric sense. And then this one up here, uh, point A for apogee, uh, 30, comma 20, meter for meter. Uh, that would be a normal size arc for, you know, it's not going to be a home run. You know, 60 meters is like uh, 100 and... 80, 200 feet, something like that, somewhere in there. Uh, so that's not going to be a home run. But it's going to be a base hit. 
uh, or maybe a, 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 uh, an out. Uh, it's going to be in the outfield somewhere. So this is normal size for a baseball. So this is all good. All right. All right. So let's say that we have a baseball uh, 30 meters downrange when it hits point A and 20 meters up when it hits point A. Uh, and you guys, point A, I mentioned, is the symbol. I, I typically use the letter A to represent the very top of the arc uh, of this kind of a parabola. And the reason I do that is because it is known, if, if it was at mission control, this would be the apogee, A-P-O-G-E-E. -E. It's mentioned in the textbook. Apogee is from the Greek, uh, wor the Greek root word apo, uh, meaning away from. Uh, the word apostle, you may have heard of, somebody that's sent away on a specific mission. Uh, G, G-E-E, -E, is from the Greek root word for earth. G, G-O. Right? So the apogee is the point on a gravitational trajectory, which this is, that is farthest away, Cain, from the center of the earth. Right? Now, the second point on a gravitational trajectory, uh, or the second, um, the additional special point, is called perigee, P-E-R-I-G-E-E. -E. And if you listen to the, the guys at Mission Control, you know, after the spacecraft launches, you know, they'll say, well, it's approaching apogee, or oh, it's, a, it's approaching perigee. Now, perigee, para means above. Okay, periscope means to scope something out above. So, you know, the periscope rises above the surface of the water from the submarine and you scope out, you know, the coast of New Jersey or whatever you're looking at. Okay, perigee is the point uh, above the surface of the planet, uh, Earth, uh, the, and it's the closest point. So apogee is the furthest point. Perigee is the closest point. And for instance, um, John Glenn, on, on his famous uh, orbital um, trajectory back, whatever it was, 50-something years ago, he, uh, he had an elliptical orbit. I looked it up the other day. And his elliptical orbit had a perigee that was closer to Earth than the apogee. Okay, it was, so slightly elliptic. It, in other words, it wasn't perfectly circular. Anyway, so apogee point A, furthest point from the surface of the earth. Now, I want to mention something to you. It's not in the slide, but I want you to write it down in your notes. And that is that the arc of the baseball has left to right symmetry when you're looking at it from this point of view. Now, I don't have the second half of the arc mapped out here. I could. If you have room on your text in your notes, go ahead and pencil that in if you can do it, so that it's a perfect mirror, left, right, flip-flop of this one, right? So that it curves back down the outfield in exactly the same shape as this one curved upward uh, to the apogee, all right? Uh, and so the, the parabola, the parabolic arc, the ballistic arc, is considered to be symmetric left, right, uh, about the vertical line that I've got here on the right that goes through point A. So that is the symmetry line uh, for this uh, trajectory. And uh, so you can put, you know, an, a copy of it uh, to the right of this if you have room on your space, or, uh, on your page. That being the case, the second, and you might want to write this down carefully. I'll try to speak slowly. The second half of the trip to the outfield takes the same amount of time as the first half. So from home plate to apogee, that amount of time is the same as the amount of time from apogee out to where the outfielder retrieves the ball, the second half of the trajectory. And that is important because there's no such thing as horizontal gravity. And because there's no such thing as horizontal gravity, 
the amount of time it takes to go from apogee down to the outfield is the same as the amount of time a straight 20 meter drop would take. So pencil in over to the left here, or you know, way over to the side or somewhere where it makes sense to you, a 20 meter straight drop. And what I'm saying to you is the second half of the arc will take the same amount of time to go from apogee to the ground as a straight drop. All right? And I've got a straight 20 meter drop here. So the baseball starts up here, and here's my animation. It drops down to here, 20 meters, and that is a certain amount of time. If you know the distance, you could figure out the time. And that drop time, which we're going to figure out next, is the key that unlocks the puzzle of this entire uh, program, this entire objective of getting the equations of motion. If we can get the drop time, we can figure out everything else. And, Jahan, we get the drop time from the drop distance. So let's, let's tackle that. Okay? The drop distance tells me the drop time, and that's, that's the starting point for our strategy. And, you know, if you've ever done a crossword puzzle, you know, I love doing crossword puzzles. Uh, you know, I, like, you know, the USA Today and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, if you ever do a crossword puzzle, you know, you could get really frustrated. But you keep working, and eventually, you know, you're down in the, the lower right corner of the crossword puzzle, and then you start getting a bunch of words. And then you can start going to the left and, and upward, and you get the whole puzzle filled out. You know, so it's sometimes you can be frustrated until you get to 63 across, and then you start getting that, and then put it all together. And that's what we're going to do here. Our strategy is to use this equation uh, to figure out the drop time. All right? And that drop time from 20 meters is going to be the same as the rise time. I mean, because the, the arc is symmetric left and right. So the rise, to, you know, whatever it is, two point something uh, seconds, is going to be the same as the drop time. Another two point seconds to get back down to the ground. All right? And so that's our strategy. Now, we're going to execute it from the drop distance formula. Right. And we, we know, uh, and, and, and I said, we're going to start from the spatial dimensions of the map, this, the XY map. 20 meters high, 30 meters across. Okay, we're starting with 20 meters high. Drop distance. All right. And then the equation we're going to plug that into, I don't have any, well, I do have G, that's 9.8. And hey, you guys, this is a drop distance. So we're just going to use positive 9.8. Eventually, later on today, we'll be using negative 9.8 because we're going to need that in our equation of motion for the velocities and the coordinates. But let's get this drop time first. Let's plug in what we know. 1 half g, yeah, I got it, 4.9 meters per second squared. So that's on the left. And then t squared, which I'm trying to figure out, that's over there on the left, and that's equal to 20 meters. All right. Now, how do you get t squared by itself? What do you do? You do. Uh huh. You divide uh, with 4.9, so it's 20.0 meters divided by 4.9 meters per second squared. Now we're going to do some cancellation there, but before we do that, uh, it suffices to say that the meters cancel, top and bottom. And hey, you guys, dividing by a fraction is the same as multiplying by the reciprocal. So meters per second squared in the denominator becomes second squared per meter. The meters cancel, and the second squared goes to the numerator. It's kind of a little jujitsu, you know, a little bit of wrestling strategy, right? And so, yeah, and the numbers are 20.0 divided by 4.9. All right, that's all good. Now you calculate that out, and you get 4.0816 
seconds squared. All right. And I'm carrying a few extra digits. I'm going to round off eventually to, to, to the hundredths place, but I'm carrying a few extra in this. Now, that's t squared. To get t itself, you have to square root that baby. All right. Now, if you haven't got your calculator out, you're going to need it today uh, for clicking. And we're going to do some clicking in a minute. Uh, get your calculator out. Verify me. What kind of a square root value is that? Now, let me remind you that uh, on the exams, midterms and final, it's good. You'll only be allowed to use a regular calculator. You won't be able to use a cell phone calculator. Now, in class lecture here, uh, yes, you can use a cell phone calculator. Uh, but just start bringing your regular calculator to class. You have it handy. You can do it. Uh, 4.0816 uh, square rooted. Uh, what do we got for that? Who's got a value? What do you got in the back? Oh, you're not in the back. That other guy was in the back. What do you got in the back? Good. And that's what I got. 2.02. .02. All right. So that's the drop time. And it is also the rise time. Ching. All right. Now you may not realize what that tells you, but let me express to you that uh, the rise time, if you start with some upward speed, for every second of rise, you're losing 9.8 meters per second. So this effectively tells us how much speed I'm going to lose on my way up to apogee. All right, we're going to use that. But before we do that, let's, cancel, let's do the cancellations. Here they are, meters and meters. All right, And then second squared goes to the top and so forth. So go ahead and pencil in your cancellations. Uh, if you haven't done it already. All right, rise time. 2.02 .02 seconds tells me how much upward speed I've lost. How does it do that? Well, uh, by looking at uh, delta V, the change in the velocity. For gravity, it's delta V equals G delta T. I know what delta T is. It's 2.02 .02 seconds. All right, so... I can use this now to figure out the initial speed because I know that at the top, I've lost all of my speed. You know, my delta V is going to be uh, V final minus V initial. Okay, V final, uh, the Y component is going to be zero. So we're, we're looking good here. All right, let's put together what we know. Uh, delta V is equal to negative 9.8 meter per second squared times 2.02 .02 seconds, the rise time. And now I'm using a minus sign to denote a downward acceleration. So now I've got directional information encoded with the minus sign. All right. So we've got to work carefully. Now, the other thing that we've got here is uh, first we've got a little bit of cancelization. Okay. One power of seconds from the denominator cancels one power of seconds in the numerator. Now I've got two powers, it's seconds squared, per second squared in the denominator uh, of g. It's all right. I haven't canceled all of them. And when I cancel one from the bottom, one from the top, I'm left with meters per second. If I multiply the numbers out, I get negative 19.799. And I'm using a few more digits there than, uh, than usual. But anyways, that's good. Negative 19.799 meters per second. Now, this baby here, delta V, that's just, um, you know, V final minus V earlier. You know, V later minus V earlier. So uh, V later is apogee, point A. So this is... 
the y component. <coughs> excuse me. The y component of the velocity at apogee minus the y component initially. The initial y component of the velocity. All right. So vay minus viy, and that's equal to a good old uh, negative. 19.799 meters per second. Now, you know, when you're, when you're taking a test from me, you want to read carefully. And one of the things you want to read is read for information. Now, there's a critical piece of information here that's underlined, and we're going to use it now. At Apogee, I've lost all the upward speed. So that means that right here, VAY is actually 0, 0.00 meters per second. Now, I don't know what VIY is, but I'm going to get it because I've got numbers everywhere here now in the equation except for VIY, so that means I can solve for VIY, the initial Y component of the velocity. So this tells me my upward launch speed. It doesn't tell me my horizontal launch speed, but my upward launch speed, yeah, we got it here. Can you see it? We're almost there. Matter of fact, that 0, 0.00 meters per second, you can go ahead and cross that out. You know, just, or I'm, I'm just going to erase it. Heck with it. It's just a zero. But I have to keep that minus sign. Okay, so I have minus VIY equals minus 19.799 meters per second. So now we're looking copacetic. And that means VIY itself is just positive 19.799 meters per second. Now let me pause for questions. I see a question. Go ahead. Gravity, the number for gravity is negative 9.8 meters per second squared here because the minus sign denotes downwardness. Okay, instead of upward. And all and now I'm using the minus sign to encode directions. Now I don't usually put a plus sign. I've got a plus sign here. All right, for VIY. That means my I'm launching it upward initially. VIY is a positive number, so that means I've got some meters per second upward at the start. The gravitation of the, the acceleration of gravity is always downward. So you're always getting faster as you go down, slower as you go up, okay? So gravity's acceleration is always, when you're trying to keep track of directions, you have to put that minus sign in there. If you consider downward to be a negative y value uh, and upward a positive y value, okay? And the same thing, uh, what is your name again? Danielle, Danielle, it's the same as x of x to the x coordinates. Usually, we give a, a leftward uh, x coordinate a negative number, and a, a rightward one positive. Okay, and it's, and the same thing with upward y coordinate positive, downward you know below the x axis is going to be negative, and same thing with the acceleration. It's a downward acceleration. It has a, a downward effect. Gravity is downward. The force of gravity is downward, always. Uh, so it has a minus sign. Now, in the drop distance formula, we didn't really need that because the drop distance formula, D equals 1 half GT squared, is simply just trying to figure out a distance, not a position. So there's a difference between a distance and a position. Okay? You have a precise position. You have to have a precise coordinate or set of coordinates. But a distance... Uh, it is, could be between two horizontal points, two vertical points, or two points at a slant, you know. So distances, you don't really need to use the negative. But for coordinates and stuff, velocities, yes, you do. All right. Another question. Yes. VAY is equal to zero because... Um, it represents the upward component of the velocity at point A, the apogee. 
And at that point, you have lost all your upward speed. That's the turning point in the motion. You start with some upward, and you eventually, by the time you get to the top, it's, it's called the top because after that, you start going downward. All right? So you have positive upward, positive, and it gets smaller, smaller, smaller. And eventually, your upward is zero. That's the turning point. And then you start, um, Danielle, after the apogee, you start getting some negative downward velocity. Okay? So that's, that's why it is. At apogee, the y component is exactly zero. That defines the apogee. Okay? And what is your name again? Alyssa. Alyssa. Okay, does that make sense to you? Yeah. Alyssa? Good. Kane. One half GT squared is a is a drop just is the drop distance formula. We're going to use one half GT squared in our coordinate formula here in a second. We're not quite there yet, but we're actually we could do it now here if we wanted to. But I want to get the horizontal speed. We can do this too now. Now that we have the drop time, that's also the amount of time it takes to go from zero to thirty meters. All right. So being as how there's no such thing as horizontal gravity, the x component of the speed, vx of t, at any time t, is just vix. You know, we're going to figure it out. It's a co constant horizontal speed. So this, the x coordinate is going to go from 0 to 30 in 2.02 seconds. Ding! We got it. Is basically a distance rectangle situation, right? Base times height, and the distance try the distance rectangle formula. Delta x equals v delta t. In this case, okay, we're using an additional subscript i x to indicate that this is the initial x component of the velocity. And, as a, and because gravity is not, there's no such thing as horizontal gravity, that never changes. So you, basically, you have a constant horizontal speed, ditto marks all the way through, and this is the simple uh, formula for figuring out delta x. Okay, delta x is the difference in the x coordinate later minus earlier. So in this case, x subscript a, the x coordinate at apogee, minus x subscript i, the initial coordinate. All right? And we know what those are. Now, vix, we don't know what that is, but we're going to find it. All right? And 2.02, that's how long it takes to get out there, 30 meters. You know, 30 meters out and, and 20 meters up, that's my rise time. Okay, rise, the drop time, we've got all that figured. we got the vertical part of the motion figured out. Now let's get the horizontal part of the motion. How about that? All right. <laughs> uh, so here we go. Let's plug in the numbers that we got. Okay, x component, or excuse me, x coordinate at apogee, x subscript a, ching, 30 meters. Initial x coordinate, 0, 0.0. Ching. 2.02, rise time. Ching. So we're just ringing in the cash here. We're putting in all we know. Now we want to get vix by itself. And the left hand side is just 30 meters. I mean, because 30 meters minus 0 meters, that's pretty easy. So you're basically boiled down to this. Cha-ching. All right, and when you calculate that out, uh, who's got a number? That's going to be a little bit less than 15. Because the, numer the numerator is a little bit bigger than 2. So the quotient itself is going to be a little bit smaller than 15. What do you got with the tie? Okay, and I got the same 14... You guys verify? 14.849 approximately? Good. I see you in the back. Good. Back in the very back row. 
All right, Bobby, hey. So, I have one word for you. Sweet. Because we can now put together the equations of motion. You know, we, we got VIY, we, we had that. Now we got VIX, and that doesn't change. So we're looking good here. All right. And now with the equations of motion that we put together, we're bringing it all together, we'll be able to predict the position and the velocities at any time we need. So when that cannonball hits the battleship X, you know, out there in the, the harbor of Venice, you know, it's attacking Venice and, uh, and the kingdom of Venice. And, uh, you know, it's out there and you're, you're lobbing cannonballs out there. You're going to know how fast it's going to hit the deck, you know, and start busting up stuff. All right, here it is. The X component of the velocity at any time, ding, it's just a set number. No such thing as horizontal gravity. So once you get it, that's it. You're done. For all times T. 14.85 meters per second. Cha-ching. Now, the y component, let's look at that. The second equation here. V subscript y as a function of time is, all right, the initial 19.8, zero. And now I'm, I'm, I'm rounding. I'm, I'm done with my calculations. I'm now writing down my solution. And I'm going to two decimal points on my velocities. 19.80 meters per second. That's my initial upward launch speed. All right, so I got some upward 19.80 and some sideways positive 14.85. So I'm heading up and, and heading to the right. You know, I'm arcing towards the outfield. So, But I'm also losing 9.8. Meters per second squared. I'm losing, for every second of that rise time, I'm losing 9.8 meters per second of speed. All right? And my wonderful students, guess what? These coordinates, excuse me, these equations encode the velocity all the way through the arc, not just to the apogee, but all the way down to the outfield when the outfielder retrieves the ball, okay? This will work through the entire motion, all right? And on the second half, your VIYs, or excuse me, the second half, your VY is going to be negatory, all right? After 2.02 .02 seconds, you're going to start piling up the negatives. That's all right because you're heading down, all right? So Danielle, in the set, this will work all the way through. And in the second half, the VY formula, once you get past apogee, so like 2.3 seconds, if you figure out VY, it's going to be a negative number. Because after 2.02 .02 seconds, you're heading downward. You're heading back down. You know, you go up for 2.02 .02 seconds, and then after that, you're starting to arc back down again to the outfield. So that number in the second equation, if you put in 2.02 .02 and calculate it out, it's going to be a negative number, all right? Students, I'll leave it up to you to use that uh, on the homework. You're going to be working. Uh, I'm going to give you some points, some miscellaneous point. On the arc, you're going to figure this stuff out for yourselves. Okay, I think I'll, I'll even give you this particular trajectory so you'll be able to use these formulas. All right? And just kind of crank out some velocities and positions and see how, you, you know, see how it works. And it'll work nice. Positions, here we go. X subscript F, yeah. X subscript uh, F and, and Y subscript F. Or if you like, you could write X as a function of time, x of t equals, 
And then in the second equation, y of t equals, right? Now, x subscript f, the first equation here in the box. Initial position, x subscript i, 0, 0.0, that's easy. And then 14.85 meters per second times whatever my time is. Distance rectangle. No such thing as horizontal gravity. So, Bobby, this equation, you just got a distance rectangle. Ching. And that's the x coordinate. So it's just, you know, and <clears throat> I'll add a side note since I really like the after lunch bunch. That's you guys. My side note is this is the x, this is the position of the shadow of the baseball on the field. So if, the, if, if it's directly at noon and the sun is directly overhead, It'll cast a shadow directly below the baseball. And this is the x coordinate of it. All right. All right. Now, the y coordinate, y subscript f or y of t, uh, initial y coordinate, 0, 0.0. That's pretty easy. And then, okay, dist it has an initial velocity. Distance rectangle, 19.80 meters per second times t, right? And then here's the, uh, Kane, here's the one-half gt squared, and this one is a negative 9.8 meters per second squared to symbolize downwardness, Danielle. Okay, so now this is going to go, you're never going to go... Um, negative here because all your y coordinate if it's a baseball diamond you know the field is the the minimum the lowest you can go is zero okay because that's the you know the outfield okay so it's always going to be a positive number but you're going to go all the way to the top and then start losing and this is eventually going to start losing altitude for you because it's the minus sign all right and so that's that's the one half gt squared, and I've I've just typed it in there. It's a negative four point nine meters per second squared. So now you know the rest of the story. You can get everything, position, velocities at any point, at any time t, by using these formulas. And homework four, I think I'm going to give you this problem, uh, and just work on a few. And it's going to be calculations. And we're going to have some clicker calculations here in just a second. So make sure your clicker is ready for, ready for action. Your brain is ready for action. But homework, yeah, you're going to have this. Okay. Now, um, let me pause for more questions. Yes. What is your first name? Keely. Keely. Oh, kind of like in uh, the Lord of the Rings. No, uh, the uh, the Hobbit. One of the one of the dwarves. Very good, Keely. Good. Okay, now I've got you. I've got the context. Good. Go ahead with your question. Negative nine point eight. The negative sign signifies downward effect. Downward. No, it's negative 9.8 through the whole arc. The whole arc, it's negative 9.8. But the effect on the way up is slowing down. But on the way down, it's speeding up. Downward speed up, upward slow down. You know what? Go ahead and write that down. The negative 9.8 meters per second squared, Danielle. Another way to think of it. Upward slow down, downward speed up. All right, that's what the minus sign encodes. All right, acceleration wise. Okay, does that answer your question? Okay, Keely. Another question When would the acceleration be positive? Well, gravity is always downward. 
So G is always going to be negative 9.8. You ignore, uh, what is your name? Christy? Okay, Christy. You ignore the negative sign temporarily in a simple dis, uh, drop distance equation. But when you're trying to get an exact coordinate, you have to have a minus sign in there. Now, this is only free fall. There are other accelerated systems. For instance, your car. Okay, do you have a car? You got a vehicle? Okay. So when you get in your car and you're heading out on university, you get to the red light, university in Alafaya, and you're there and you gun the engine, you're accelerating forward. So that would be, actually, you're accelerating to the west. So if we were looking down from space, you might consider west to be a negative number, a left number. You know, if you're looking down from, you know, like Google Maps, that would be to the left on Google Maps. So when you accelerate through the light heading west, that might be a negative acceleration. But if you're coming to UCF at that same intersection and you're heading into UCF, you're heading east, so from Google Maps, that's rightward, so that would be a positive acceleration. So it just depends on the system. Free fall, always negatory. Cars, buses, you know, uh, roller coasters, you know, any kind of physical system you think of, all kinds of different accelerations. So you just got to be alert to that. But free fall, yep, always negatory. Another question. Uh, Christine. Is Christine or Christina? Christine? It, I'm asking. Is it Christine or Christina? Okay. Christy. Okay. Christy. That's easy. And Keely and Abigail and Danielle. Kane. Uh, who else? Just practicing names here. Uh, I think I know some more names. Anyway. Abigail, you had a question. So this is, like, if you was just asking us as a question, it would be like, what point is this ball at? Is this there? Yeah, if I ask you what point is the baseball at when the clock reads two, uh, 1.7 seconds, you'd be able to say, all right, it's X coordinate is, you know, whatever it says, and then the Y coordinate is, and, then, and you'd be able to map it up on graph paper, all right? Another question. Yes, Kane. Repeat. No way to simplify it. Actually, I take that back. There is a way to simplify it, but you'd lose the... If you want to encode by time, you have to keep them separated. But theoretically, you could write one equation for a parabola. You know, it'd be uh, x, it'd be y equals something times x squared, um, which I discuss in the textbook, uh, but you, you wouldn't be able to predict with that formula. These are the coordinates, the x and the y coordinates is a function of time. All right, let's keep going. I want to talk about some more about Newton's laws of motion, as I said. I have some questions. And the first question involves the state of motion of a blue car. Question number one for today. And if you're using your clicker for the first time, hold the power button down until the rectangle flashes in the upper left of the display, then type BB. You'll get the Go Nitro message, and then the Ready message, and then you can type in a letter. The blue car moves it to the right at a constant speed. What does that mean? Thirty seconds. Read carefully and answer. Fifteen seconds. Ten. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, 
two, one, zero. Ching. All right, you guys did good. This is the correct answer. Um, and if you an a few of you answered A, um, whenever you see the word constant speed um, and accelerating, those are mutually exclusive. All right. So constant velocity and, and uh, now here's a diagram that you might want to add. Um, you know, as, as we said, as we've been thinking about, Galileo said, the universe is a grand book, and the language it's written in is mathematical. Here's a mathematical shape, an arrow, and here's a mathematical statement. V subscript I is 10, for instance, for example, 10.5 meters per second to the right. All right, and that's a... It's a mathematical statement and a mathematical symbol, the arrow, and a, and a mathematical uh, object, a point, right? The point to represent the center of mass of this blue vehicle. Uh, and that's an accurate, you know, so that's like 20-something miles an hour. Uh, all right, so that's our first clicker question. I want, and, and we've talked about Newton's first law the law of inertia. Let's talk about the second law now. Right? The first law said, um, if you have balanced forces or no forces, you're going to keep going at a constant velocity or at the state of rest. But what happens if you have unbalanced forces? If you have unbalanced forces, you're going to accelerate. Now, in this diagram that you can start sketching, that represents two opposing forces. Uh, one for Dwight Howard to the right, and one for that record weenie, LeBron James, to the left. All right? Now, in this, this diagram, the geometric object, uh, the arrow for Dwight Howard, is longer than the, white, than the arrow for LeBron James. So there's going to be a net force. Dwight Howard's going to win. And net force is what we want to talk about. You add up all the forces. So in this one, the leftward force for LeBron James would have a negative number, and the rightward force for Dwight Howard would have a positive number. So you just add them up, a positive plus a negative. And in this case, you come up with a positive number. Let's work this out. If they, if they don't bounce, then you get a net force. And the symbol for that is F subscript net. Uh, and, you know, and it could have an arrow over the top to represent um, the directionality. And in the example, let's say that Dwight Howard has a positive number, 100 units of force to the right. And let's say that his enemy on the basketball court, LeBron James, has 80 units of force to the left. So that means we've got a minus 80 uh, for LeBron James's numeric um, value, the force, the numeric value of LeBron James's force, right? Now, that means uh, 100 plus negative 80 is equal to 20, positive. So the net force on the basketball is 20 newtons, and that means Dwight Howard wins and gets the rebound, right? And that's how you figure out a net force. Now, in two dimensions, I'll probably show you on Tuesday how to tackle a net force in two dimensions. You know, so like a leftward force and a, a vertical upward force. Yeah, you know, we, can, we can deal with that. You know, you'll have a mixture. But if it's one's left and one's right, or one's up and one's down, yeah, you can deal with it, pluses and minuses, no problem. All right, now... Sir Isaac Newton says, all right, if you have something that the, the, the forces don't balance out, then you're going to accelerate. And the more net force, the more push you have, the more acceleration. Now, that made sense to Sir Isaac Newton, and I hope it makes sense to you. So that means that Arnold Schwarzenegger... If he bench presses you through a door, you're going to go flying. But if a little shrimpy kindergartner tries to push you through a door, 
and all your, you know, you're not going to go flying, right? Smaller force, right? So more acceleration for more force, less, less force, less acceleration. Now, more kilograms of mass. Now we've got to start taking into account mass. And Sir Isaac Newton is the guy that figured out how to do that. Now, Galileo's famous experiment from the top of the Leaning Tower of Pisa, you know, you drop a cannonball, drop a musket ball, and regardless of the mass, they are reached the ground at the same time. That is true for free fall, but not for all systems. And Sir, Sir Isaac Newton says, all right, if you have a mass, it's going to decrease the amount of acceleration. So the more mass you have, the less acceleration you're going to see. All right? Now, what this means is that if, if you were to write an expression for the acceleration, you know, acceleration equals, the, f the net force would be on the numerator and the mass would be in the denominator. You know, more mass, quotient smaller. More net force, quotient bigger. All right, and here's the equation. That's what works. Mother Nature uses this equation. Okay, so what we measure is the acceleration. And from that, we deduce um, a force. Right? So A equals F net divided by M. Another way to write it, is equivalent, is um, F net equals MA. Right? And so both of those are equivalent. You know, one is just taking M over to the other side, cross multiply by M. You get the second one. And scientists around the world are always thinking about F equals MA. So, it, and I've written it with a subscript net. But, you know, a, a, an engineering major or a rocket scientist down at Mission Control, they're going to be thinking, you know, in their, or if they're talking in the cafeteria or something like that, they're going to be saying F equals MA. And, and his, his buddy says, yeah, F equals MA in this case. Everybody knows that. And then they start talking about F equals But they're really talking about F net equals MA. Anyways. Now, uh, that is the equation that rules the universe so far as we can see. All right. Now, I want to give you some more details. Over here on the upper left, that's the definition of acceleration. You know, that's a couple lectures ago. Right? Delta V over delta T. And down here below it, A equals F net over M, Newton's second law. And then below that, F equals MA, Newton's second law. Now here's another way of writing Newton's second law with the definition of acceleration substituted in there. F equals M delta V over delta T. And this version is going to be very instructive for us. They're all equivalent. Those three bottom equations are all equivalent. But this one is uh, instructive for us because it will help you, it, it will be consistent with your physical intuition of the things that you do and the things that you see in everyday life. Now, what are the measurements needed for uh, Newton's second law? Well, we've got to have some time measurements. I mean, we've got to have a delta T for the acceleration. And delta V re requires time measurements and some position, distance measurements and stuff. right? And then the M, that's the mass, got to have some kilograms. So you have to have some way of figuring out the mass. So some kind of a scale, you know, a balance. Uh, and then you've got a calculations to do. You measure distances, you measure times, you measure mass, and you calculate velocities. And then for velocities, you calculate acceleration. So the direct measurements, the fundamental units, are meters, seconds, and kilograms. Right? The force is derived from that. Acceleration and velocity are derived from that. Okay, now 
On this, I want to talk about stopping time. If you're, if you're in a car and you're moving at 10 miles per hour and you run into a solid brick wall and your car stops, it's going to stop like that. It's going to stop very quickly. All right? You know, like in a tenth of a second or less. And there's going to be a huge amount of damage to your car, even at 10 miles an hour, unless you have like a 1970 Pontiac, you know, one of those big, you know, 20 foot long boats that I can remember from when I was a little kid, you know, a big urban assault vehicle built like a tank, you know, it might get a little dent in it. But every, everything's on the road now, 10 miles an hour into a brick wall, that's it, man. You get a lot of damage. And that's because the stopping force is really big. You know, if you're at 10 miles an hour, your delta V is um, 10 miles per hour to zero. So delta V is minus 10. And delta T is, you know, whatever it happens to be. And then the mass of the car is whatever that happens to be. Now, if you stop in a snow drift, for instance, you're up north in Vermont or something, and you're at 10 miles an hour, and you're going across the park, and up there, you know what, what they do is in like a big parking lot, they'll plow the snow off to the side of the parking lot. And so, yeah, if you, if you lose control of your car in the parking lot, and you're at 10 miles an hour, and you come to a stop at a snow drift, it'll take maybe a second to stop. It's very gentle, okay? And then your car doesn't get wrecked because delta T is smaller, right? So more stopping time, bigger denominator, smaller stopping force, all right? Less stopping time, brick wall, smaller denominator, larger force, larger stopping force, all right? Now that's in terms of cars coming to a stop. Another place where you where you think about that uh, is uh, at the gym, you know, doing plyometrics. Raise your hand if you do plyometric workouts at the gym from time to time. One. One. No, two. I see another hand. Boy, I guess we got a, a but. Raise your hand if you know what plyometrics is. Yeah, people know about it, but they don't do it. All right. Anyways, a popular plyometric workout is box jumping. You know, you jump up on the box, you jump down from the box, you know, different heights, stuff like that. And it helps you develop explosiveness. Okay. Now, when you jump onto the box, when you jump down from the box, you know, you have a certain height that you jump from. Okay. You know, so you jump from, you know, uh, 16 inches height. And so that means a certain drop distance, a certain amount of drop time, a certain amount of delta V. So the delta, so if you jump, there's a certain amount of delta V, you know, based on the height of the box. All right. And that's set for anybody. But the delta V, or excuse me, the delta T is the stopping time. Now you control that by flexing your knees. So if you land straight legged, and don't flex your knees, you're going to come to an abrupt stop and you're going to hurt. You don't do that when you do plyometrics, do you? Yeah, you don't do that. Nobody does that. You know, you flex your knees, right? And you come to, you know, you're supposed to have explosiveness, but you don't want to have total zero uh, stopping time, right? So it, it makes you, you, you bend your knees, it's a little bit easier on your knees, okay? Stopping time, plyometrics. Now we're going to have some questions about that on the homework, so... Uh, I keep getting messages here. Uh, we're almost, we got another 13 minutes. Let's keep going. I got a couple questions for you about Newton's second law. We're going to do some calculations. And uh, the first one, make this part of your notes. Make this actual question part of your notes. Liter bottle of water. Okay, a liter is a thousand cc's, and every cc of water is defined to be. A gram. So a thousand grams, that's one kilogram. It accelerates from your pull force at one meter per second squared. So using F equals MA, what's the size of your net pull force? And read carefully.
20 seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay, some of you missed it. Uh, go ahead and show the. Okay, uh, some of you voted for A, uh, some of you voted for B, uh, some of you voted for C. But let's take a look at what it what it actually is. Go up to the. The actual answer is um, kilogram meter per second squared. Go ahead and make a note of that. Um, this is actually the official definition of the unit of force in the metric system. And we call it the Newton. And it's just an MA. F equals MA, a mass, one kilogram, times an acceleration. So a Newton, a force of one Newton, accelerates a one kilogram object at an acceleration of one meter per second squared, all right? And in the metric system, the symbol is capital N, but it behooves you to remember that it's actually derived from the fundamental units, kilogram meter per second squared, right? And sometimes in an equation, you know, like you're making a calculation, you know, of a stopping time, you might want to use kilogram meter per second squared instead of the symbol N uh, so that uh, you can um, uh, cancel. You know, you might want to cancel kilograms or something like that. All right? You can do that if you have it in kilogram meter per second squared. And we'll be showing you how to do that. So anyways, F equals MA. The unit of F, the net force, is the Newton. You know what it is in the English system? Uh, pound. The unit of mass in the English system is the slug. I have never used, I never intend to use, I do not want to ever use slugs. I do not like slugs. They're greasy and slimy. And even in the metric system, uh, kilograms is much nicer. And speaking of kilograms, let's talk about a big old T-Rex. Actually, this is a baby T-Rex, 342 kilograms. That's not that big. But let's figure out uh, the weight force on a 342 kilogram T-Rex. Hit the refresh key on your calculator, or excuse me, on your uh, eye clicker. And then you'll come up with the number one and then use the up and the down arrow keys to select numbers. Now type in an answer to the nearest Newton. So if your answer is 27.693 Newtons, then type in a 28. And then hit the send key. You have to type in your number and then hit send. All right. No, don't type in 28. Two people just typed in 28. Gosh. That's like, you guys, whenever, I, put, I always put this in for a calculation. Homework, exam, class, clicking. The number, I, the, my EG number, is never correct. It's not even close to correct. I will never put a number in the EG part that's even close to correct. So don't type it in. They still have it. I don't know. Sometimes you guys, I don't know. Anyways, do that to the nearest... Newton and uh, scary T-Rex, and I'll drink some coffee up here. Kane, can you ask the guy sitting next to you what his first name is? What is it? Dominic. Dominic, Dom. So you're Dom. What's your last name? Willis. Very good. I may as well know all the three of these up here in the front row. 
And eventually I'll know everybody up here in the front. Kiwi. I don't know why I started thinking of the, you know, the Lord of the Rings, the Hobbits. How do you spell it? Very nice. It's unusual. I've never heard of somebody with that first name. It's good, though. Thirty seconds. Fifteen seconds. We're looking good here. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five. Four, three, two, one, zero. Ching. All right. Answer. Thirty-three fifty-two. Raise your hand if you got that. Excellent. Okay. Now, uh, can you switch to computer display, please? All right. Now, I want you to look at this. This is the scoreboard for a numeric question. This is what it looks like. Can you scroll down? Oh, actually, don't scroll down yet. Uh, five people typed in uh, 3351.6, which is an accurate number, I think, but it's not rounded correctly. So if you do that on an exam, I'm going to mark you down for that. It won't, you know, if this is a three-point question, I might give you two points, all right? So if I tell you to round carefully, do that, all right? Uh, go down a little bit. 3351, look at that. Two people typed that in. Uh, that's incorrect. Uh, they rounded down instead of up. Uh, let's see, 34897. Whoa. Some of these, I'm not really sure. 332. Oh, you know what? I think maybe some of you are using 1 half GT squared or something. Maybe. I'm not sure. They have a one fact factor. 350. Look at that, 351.8. That is 351.8. Somebody dropped a three. All right. But the reason we're trying these now is because I want you to get used to this. So in exams, you don't screw things up. Anyways, that's good. Thanks. Go back to the regular display. All right, let's keep going. I have a couple more things to go over with you before we dismiss. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about mass, the quantity of inertia. Um, when we say that it's the quantity of inertia, or inertia is quantized as a mass, uh, we mean that the more mass you have, the harder it is to change your velocity, you know, your dynamical state. It's, it's, and that's why we call it inertia. You know, the more of it, the more inert your object is. Uh, the kilogram is based on the gram. The gram is a cubic centimeter of water. So basically what you do to measure something, I mean, in a primitive sense, you know, um, you take your object and you try to balance it in the balance. Uh, so like a basketball on the right side and some water on the left. And this is a kilogram bottle of water, so it's a little bit heavier than a basketball, so it's not balanced. So what you would do is you would take some water out and then, you know, until they, you know, exactly come even. And then that number of cc's is the number of grams of mass in your object. Now, we don't do that anymore. I mean, it, it, back in the 1800s or whatever it was, when they figured out the metric system, you know, gram, cubic centimeter water... They did that, and now they have, you know, um, you know, metal weights and stuff like that. But yeah, standard grams are based on water. So a thousand grams, and and the basketball is less than a thousand grams, so it's uh, it's uh, up there. All right. Now I want to keep going and talk a little bit more about the direction of the net force and the direction of the acceleration. So 
the net force on an object is equal to its mass times acceleration. And it points in the same direction as the acceleration. Right? So if you get a force of 45 degrees from your velocity, like in this diagram, you're getting a little bop um, from port and from aft. That's going to push you forward and to starboard. All right, so it's going to change your speed, and actually it's going to change your direction as well. Changing the direction counts as an acceleration because it changes the velocity arrow. Even if, you know, even if you don't have a change in speed, if you change the direction, um, that counts as an acceleration. All right. So the way that you would express that directionality is simply this, that the, the net force direction is the same as the acceleration direction. Now, acceleration is something that we can uh, base directly on measurements. We figure out positions, times, calculate velocities, then and velocity arrows, then a delta V arrow, and then an acceleration arrow. So the acceleration can always be expressed as some kind of an arrow in some direction. And the net force is going to be in that same direction. So if I tell you that you have a net, uh, if, if, if I tell you that you have an acceleration to the right, that means your net force is going to be rightward. All right? Uh, this is meant to be for Monday. Is there a pair of skateboards in the hall? I want you to bring skateboards on Monday. But before I dismiss, I want to tell you something about the exam coming up. So bring your skateboards Monday, if you will. Um, so information for GEP about exam one. Uh, we're going to have a re it, actually this should be for next Thursday, but we'll have a review assignment uh, next Thursday night and a regular assignment. Um, it's going to be a 50 point test. And it'll be about 45 scan try items and usually about three eye clicker two items. So you have to bring your eye clicker. Um, any calculator with a square root key, but not a cell phone. The raspberry flavored Scantron, which is, uh, it's got the Pegasus logo on there. Uh, and also, and you, you have to know your PID, your UCF ID number. All right. And so you have to bubble that in. Now, the other thing that I want to mention to you is that uh, in this, um, you're going to have a formula matching. Boy, these guys are leaving. And this is the thing that worries a lot of people. They don't even. Uh, you don't have to memorize formulas. I'm not going to give you a formula sheet either. So you don't have to do either one of those things. You, the first few questions on the test will be matching questions. So you'll have a, a list of formulas, and then number one, two, and three will be a few concepts or like the name of the formula. And so you do, you know, matching with that. And so the first exam, I might have, you know, three or four, four or five questions of this kind so that you'll have the formulas that you need, but you won't have to memorize them you'll have to recognize them because you'll have the definition uh, on the left and the formula itself on the right or vice versa. And, you know, you'll make out okay there. So do not focus on memorizing formulas, right? You can do it, but it's not going to really help you that much because of this. All right, you're dismissed. I'll see you. Um, on Tuesday, homework four will be activated later tonight.